Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood. Robert Powell plays Louis Mazzini and members of the Dascoin family in Kind Hearts and Coronets, a radio version of the Ealing Studios film based on the novel Israel Rank by Roy Horniman and adapted by Gilbert Travers Thomas from the screenplay by Robert Hamer and John Dighton. Kind Hearts and Coronets. Capital Punishment Amendment Act, 1868. The sentence of the law passed upon Louis Dascoigne Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont, found guilty of murder, will be carried into execution at 8 a.m. tomorrow. And you, Kate, <laughs> well, well. Good evening, Mr. Elliot. Uh, good evening, Warder. Nice drop of rain. <laughs> yes. Just sign the book, if you will. Yeah. Been keeping you busy, Mr. Elliot? Oh, just nicely, you know. We went up to Manchester on Monday. Poison a baby farmer at Holloway this morning. Very ordinary crimes, both of them. <laughs> this one we've got for you tomorrow is... Something special. Oh, yes, very much so. Even after all my years in the profession, I'm quite looking forward to him. There you are, Water. Thank you. Well, I must uh, I must be getting along. Is the governor in? Yes, he's expecting you. Yeah, well, uh, good night. Good night, Mr. Elliot. The uh, usual cup of tea at seven. Oh, please. Yes? Good evening, Governor. Well, Elliot... <laughs> This is a very terrible occasion. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, it is indeed, sir. Even my lamented master, the great Mr. Berry himself, never had the privilege of hanging a duke. Uh, right, right. Yes, what a finale to a lifetime in the public service. <laughs> uh, finale? Oh, yes, yes. I intend to retire after using the silken rope never again to be content with hemp. Right. Uh, do you wish to um, have a look at the duke? Just a glimpse, an idea of size and weight, you know. Quite. Mm. How will he approach it? I should think as the calmest you ever know. A noblesse oblige, doubtless. Mm. A difficult clan can make things most distressing. You, uh, yes, I, um, I almost forgot. Uh, mm. you, you must um, forgive my ignorance, but uh, when we meet in the morning, what is the correct form of address? Uh, uh, your lordship. Your grace. Your grace, oh, yes. Uh, well, well, thank you, yes. Uh, good morning, your grace. Uh, good morning, your grace. Your grace, good morning. <laughs> good evening, your grace. Ah, good evening, colonel. Will you have a glass of wine? Uh, thank you, no, I... Uh... I called to inquire whether you had any special wishes for breakfast. Just coffee and a slice of toast, thank you. Oh, and perhaps a few grapes. I hate to disappoint the newspaper reading public, but it'll be too early for the conventional hearty breakfast. The appointment is at eight, is it not? Uh, at eight, uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, well, uh, if there's nothing further I can do for you... Nothing, thank you, Colonel, unless... Your grace... This quill, it scratches abominably as I write. Oh, of course. I'll have another sent down from my office. Thank you. We shall have the opportunity of making our adieu in the morning, I presume? I regret to say, yes. Good night, Your Grace. Good night, Colonel. A brief history of the events leading thereto written on the eve of his execution by Louis Dascoigne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, who ventures to hope that this confession of his guilt may prove not uninteresting to those who remain to read it. With so little time remaining to complete my story, it's difficult to choose where to begin it. Perhaps I should begin at the beginning. My mother was the daughter of the 7th Duke of Chalfont, as soon as she was of age, she eloped with a handsome Italian singer called Mazzini. 
thus exchanging the medieval splendours of Chalfont Castle for the modern conveniences of number 73 Balaclava Avenue, London South West, where, after a decent interval, I arrived on the scene. Carino, carino, come si bellissimo bambino! However, my father succumbed to a heart attack at the moment of his first setting eyes on me. Thus, early in his career, Papa was sent to join the heavenly choir, and in the circumstances it will be understood that I have but light memory of him. Reduced to an even deeper poverty by my father's death, Mama swallowed her pride and made an effort of reconciliation with her family. They did not even reply to her letter. So... In order to keep us both alive, she was reduced to the horrible expedient of taking a lodger. And this is the sitting room, Mr Perkins. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, nice little place you've got here, Mrs... Um, yes. Um. I shall do my best to make you comfortable, Mr Perkins, should you decide to stay. Oh, well, uh, Mrs... Uh, I uh, think we might come to some arrangement... Uh, Say, twenty-five shillings a week. Thus, protected by Mamma's small annuity and the weekly contributions of Mr Perkins, I passed from infancy to childhood in an atmosphere of family history and genealogies until I knew the descent of the House of Chalfont by heart. The dukedom had been bestowed by Charles II on Colonel Henry Dascoyne for services rendered to His Majesty during his exile. Sire! Later, for services rendered to His Majesty after his restoration by the Duchess. Oh, sire. <clears throat> the title was granted the unique privilege of descending by the female as well as the male line. It was, therefore, theoretically possible that via Mama I might inherit the dukedom. Mama scraped and saved and sent me to the best school she could afford. In view of my present predicament, one little incident there occurs to me as amusing. Lionel Holland, what is the Sixth Commandment? <clears throat> come, come now, surely you know what the Sixth Commandment is. Oh, someone else, then. Uh, Sibella. Uh, I know, please. Louis Mazzini. All right, tell us. Thou shalt not kill. No. In those days, I never had any trouble with the Sixth Commandment. As to the Seventh, I was hardly of an age to concern myself with it. Although I was old enough to be in love, Sibella, for that was her name, and her brother were my only friends, and we grew up together. In their case, Mama relaxed her objection to my associating with the local children. At least their father, Dr. Hallwood, was a professional man. But alas, those carefree school days soon passed. And when I was seventeen... Mamma decided to have a serious talk with me. Now, Louis, the time has come to think very carefully about your future. Well, it should be quite easy to get a job. Oh, not a job, dear. A career. Now, who do we know who could help us? We don't really know anyone, except the family, and they don't know us. Well, the least we can do is try once more. I shall write to Lord Ascoyne, Dascoyne. He can surely do something in that bank of his. Bank, Mamma. Uh, this is a private bank, Louis, dear. They don't pass money over the counter. The letter was duly dispatched, and this time we did get an answer. Madam, I am instructed by Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne to inform you that he is not aware of your son's existence as a member of the Dascoyne family. Huh. Signed by his secretary. It's very stupid of him, of them all, not to admit your existence, when one day you might be Duke of Chalfont. Even potential dukes have to eat. Mr. Perkins, our lodger now for nearly 15 years, did his best to be helpful. Well, Louise, I've had another chat with Mr. Parsons, our manager. I gather you created a very favourable impression when you saw him. I thought you would, Louis. He says you can start any time you like. I suggest Monday week. Thank you very much, Mr. Perkins. Did he say anything about wages? Well, um, times are hard, Louis. And you're only a young man, so in the circumstances, the firm don't feel that they can offer you more than 25 shillings a week. 
Thus, the possible future Duke of Chalfont became what was known as a general draper's assistant. And this humiliation continued for two dispiriting years. Then one day, Mamma, who had broken her glasses and could not afford to have them mended, was knocked down by a tram near Clapham Junction and fatally injured. Louis? Louis, where are you? I'm here, Mamma. Louis? Yes, Mamma? I should like to be buried at Chalfont, in the family vault. You're not going to die, Mamma. Promise me, Louis. Promise. Mamma? I wrote to the Duke of Chalfont, informing him of Mamma's dying wish. His reply was the curtest possible refusal. Two days later, Mamma was buried and standing by her poor little grave in that hideous suburban cemetery, I made an oath that I would revenge the wrongs her family had done her. It was no more than a piece of youthful bravado, but it was one of those acorns from which great oaks are destined to grow. Even then, I went so far as to examine the family tree and prune it to just the living members of which there were no less than twelve. But what could I do to hurt them? What could I take from them? Except, perhaps, their lives. I indulged for a moment in a fantasy of all twelve of them being wiped out simultaneously at a family reunion by unseen hand, of the penniless boy from Clapham being miraculously transplanted to his birthright. I even speculated as to how I might contrive it. But... There were other, more urgent problems. Mamma's tiny income came from an annuity and had died with her. The problem of how to live on 25 shillings a week was solved for me by an invitation from Dr. Hallwood to lodge with them. It was galling to accept the status of a poor relation, but the certainty of seeing Sibella every day was too tempting to be refused. <laughs> Well, Sibella? I'll let you into a secret, Louis. It was my idea. It was? Oh. Who's that? I've got to go out. Who with? Lionel Holland. You remember him. He's rather dull, but his father's very rich. Hmm. See you at supper. The next few years brought many such heartaches, but they also brought promotion. Laces and ribbons at 30 shillings a week. Fabrics at 32 and 6. Ladies' underwear at 35 shillings. I decided that if I was to be a draper, at least I would not be a suburban draper. So I migrated to a larger modern store which had just been opened in the West End at the gigantic salary of two pounds a week. Every lunchtime I went to the reading room of the public library to see how my inheritance was proceeding. Sometimes the death's column brought good news. Sometimes the birth column brought bad news. The advent of twin sons to the Duke was a terrible blow. Fortunately, an epidemic of diphtheria restored the status quo almost immediately and even brought me a bonus in the shape of the Duchess, who succumbed at the same time as her children. But the Duchy of Chalfont was not all absorbing. There were other matters to concern me of a more personal nature. That summer, the Hallwoods gave a party. Good evening, Sibella. Hello, Louis. You do look nice. So do you. Doesn't he, Lyle? Very. <clears throat> uh, Sibella, uh, may I have the pleasure of this dance? I'm awfully sorry, Lionel. I'm afraid I promised this one to Louis. Oh? You see, he didn't even know about it. Never mind, Lionel. You have the supper dance with me, if you like. Thank you. I seem to remember you promised the supper dance to me. Did I, Louis? I must have made a mistake. last of them, thank heaven. What an evening. Well, I thought it was a very nice evening. It may have been for you. Oh, it's awful being a woman, having to dance with a lot of dull men, laugh at their jokes while they're treading on your feet. I didn't tread on your feet. You're not dull, and your jokes are funny. Thank you. Sibella? Hmm? Sibella, will you marry me? <laughs> Louis, of course not. 
Do get up. On your knees like that, you may be half Italian, but even so, you do look silly playing the stage lover like that. I look silly, do I? Yes, very. <sighs> do I still look silly? No. Now will you marry me? No. Why not? Because I just said I'd marry Lionel. You can't. Why not? Well, he's a clod. He's not a gentleman. Listen, who's talking? Whoever heard of a gentleman blacking the lodger's boots? That's a wicked thing to say. Just because Mama was poor. Lionel will be very rich one day. I might be a duke one day. Pigs might fly. No, I might. I Really, I might. You see, Mama was the daughter of the seventh duke. Oh, yes, I know. Well, when you are a duke, you just come and show me your crown or whatever it's called, and then I'll feel awfully silly, won't I? Yes, you will. Anyhow, I am going to marry Lionel... And now I'm going to bed. Good night, Louis. If there was a precise moment at which my insubstantial dreaming took on solid purpose, that was it. The Dascoins had not only wronged my mother, they were the obstacle between me and all that I wanted. There were then some eight people between me and the dukedom, all seemingly equally out of reach. It's so difficult to make a neat job of killing people with whom one is not on friendly terms. I was almost resigned to its being an impossibility when one afternoon, at a moment when my thoughts were furthest from the subject, fate took a hand. If you've nothing better, these will have to do. I'm afraid not, sir. Oh, all right. Will a couple do, Priscilla? Oh, thank you, Charles. These London shops are so far behind Paris in this sort of thing. <laughs> Parcel them up quickly and we'll take them with us, charge them to my account. Yes, sir. What is the name? Mr. Ascoin Dascoin. At last, I was face to face with one of them. This was the son of Lord Ascoin Dascoin, the banker, whose refusal to help me toward a more dignified career had led to my present ignominious occupation. What right had this arrogant puppy to be standing on the other side of the counter ordering me about? In my excitement and anger, I listened openly to their conversation. I've booked rooms at Crookshanks at Maidenhead. I thought we'd go down late on Friday afternoon and stay till Monday. Are you sure it's safe? It's the most discreet place I know. Oh. You've been there before, then? No, of course not. No, I, I, what I mean is... Uh, uh, hey, you. Sir? Get on with that parcel and, and never mind what we're talking about. Don't you dare talk to me like that. Do you think I'm interested in your idiotic conversation? If you want to air impertinence to your eavesdropping, we'll soon see about that. Send for the manager. The upshot was that I was dismissed on the spot. I decided to repay him in kind by dismissing him with equal suddenness from this world. His conversation had told me where I could probably find the opportunity to kill him, and Dr. Hallward's dispensary could, I thought, provide me with the means... With the week's wages I had received in lieu of notice, I invested in suitable apparel for Maidenhead and booked a modest single room at Crookshanks. That evening after dinner, I took a stroll through the hotel in search of my quarry and found them having coffee and liqueurs together on the terrace. I decided to take the bull by the horns. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Forgive me, haven't we met before somewhere? I don't think so. Funny, because I could have sworn I knew your face. Uh, were you at Monty last year? The year before. Ah, that must be it. Won't you and your companion join me for a drink? Uh, thank you, not this evening. We're rather tired. Of course. <laughs> I deprecated their retiring so early, but it was hard to blame them, for weekends, like life, are short. The next morning, I waited for them to come down. And the next afternoon. But they didn't appear the whole day nor the morning after. I no longer felt sentimental. The weekend was nearly over, and I could hardly expect Providence to offer me so promising a chance again. When finally they did appear and made their way to the hotel boathouse, I was in a state of desperation. We'll take the punt. Very good, sir. Let's have some more cushions and an awning. Yes, sir. Ready, darling? <laughs> <laughs> They drifted gently off downstream, and for a while I followed them on foot, hoping for I knew not what. 
I had the poison with me, but they hadn't even taken a picnic basket. It was possible, however, that they might stop somewhere for refreshment. They did stop, shortly afterwards, but not for refreshment. And judging by past experience, they would be there for hours. I decided to hire a boat myself. I shouldn't take her down there if I were you, sir. No, oh, why not? Well, they close the weir gates at two o'clock. Is that dangerous? Oh, I, there have been one or two nasty accidents. Uh, people getting carried over the weir. Really? Aye. You'll see a notice further down telling folks to moor up securely. Do you get any warning? Oh, aye. They, they haul up a red flag and sound a hooter. Thanks. I'll be careful. The rest followed automatically. I found the punt moored under some overhanging branches further up the reach. I tied my own canoe by the bank about 30 yards upstream and, pulling off my clothes, slipped over the side into the water. My positioning was perfect. <laughs> and it took me but a second to untie the clumsy granny knot by which Mr. Ascoyne Dascoyne had secured the punt to its pole. It was beautifully timed. Charles, we're moving. But Charles, we're moving. No, we can't. I got you'll be all right. Charles, look! The weir! Jump for your life! Oh. Oh. I was sorry about the girl, but found some relief in the reflection that she had, presumably, during the weekend, already undergone a fate worse than death. Then I conceived a brilliant idea. I would write a carefully phrased letter of condolence to old Ascoyne Dascoyne. There would be an agreeable feeling of revenge for his cruelty to Mamma, and further it did not fail to occur to me that there was, at the moment, a vacancy in the banking house. Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne duly rose to the bait. Ah, Mr. Mazzini, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Please, be seated. Thank you. Uh, that photograph, isn't that um, my late son? Yes. A great loss. He was young and foolish, but I believe had he been spared until his maturity... It, it was my consciousness of that which led me to presume to tender you my sympathy. I am glad that you did so. A loss so tragic serves to put lesser matters in their proper perspective. If I remember rightly, Mr. Mazzini, uh, some years ago, I received a communication from your mother. It was, I believe, in connection with your career. Hello, Louis. You look very pleased with yourself. So do you, Sibella. I have news. And so have I. What is it? No, yours first. Lionel and I have fixed a date for our wedding in two months' time. My congratulations. No, I should congratulate him. I compliment you. Now your news. Oh, it's nothing so exciting as yours. I went today to see Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne, my cousin, you know. He has a private banking house in the city. He offered me employment at once at five pound a week with excellent prospects of promotion. Louis, I'm so glad for you. Thank you. Louis, do you remember? What? Once in this room after my party. I kissed you? Yes. And you were horrible to me? Yes, I made fun about you being related to the Dascoins. I'm sorry, Louis. You take it more seriously now? Yes. Louis, kiss me to show you've forgiven me. No. It would be wrong. Your pledge to Lionel. Oh, I behaved like a cad that night. I like you when you behave like a cad. The next candidate for removal seemed to be young Henry Dascoyne, 24 years old, recently married as yet without issue. I had quite an accumulation by now of Dascoyne data culled from newspapers and periodicals, and I looked through it for a possible approach to Henry. I soon found one. 
This interesting view of the picturesque village of Wimborne was taken by Mr. Henry Dascoyne, an enthusiastic photographer who has contributed many a beautiful study to our pages. I bought the necessary equipment, second-hand, and bicycled down the following weekend. I'd studied a couple of photographic manuals during the week and found that in practice the mysteries of the camera demanded little more than ordinary intelligence. It seemed to me that I could find no better subject for my first essay in photography than the village inn, and it was through the viewfinder of my second-hand Thornton Pickard that I first saw Henry Dascoyne emerging from the saloon bar. He watched me for a few moments, then came over. Excuse me. Yes? Isn't that a Thornton Pickard? Yes. Are you a photographer? Dabbling it, you know. Got a Sanger Shepherd myself. A Sanger Shepherd? Nice little camera. Focal plane shutter, rapid rectilinear and all that. Really? Look here. Why not come out to my house and I'll show it to you? I'd like you to meet my wife, too. Delighted. My name's Dascoin, by the way. Mine's Mazzini. You don't do your developing and so on in the house, then? No. I've had the potting shed fixed up as a dark room. Oh, I say. Couldn't have suited better if it had been built for it. Had the equipment sent down from time. And I must say, the results have been absolutely top hole. There's everything to hand. Developing dishes here, toning bath here, whole plate in larger. It's perfect. Not too bad, is it? I'll show you some quarter plates I've taken of the village, if you like. Oh, yes, please. Oh, uh, uh, talking of the village, by the by, I don't know if you're thinking of sending any of your efforts here to some periodical, but there's just one thing. Yes? Um, I, 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 I'm sure you're a good fellow, or I wouldn't like to ask you. Ask me what? I'd be most grateful if you keep back that last plate you exposed. The inn? But it was delightful. Yes. Ah, uh, no, the, the, the fact is, uh, my wife has views about such places, so I never go in them, you understand. Oh, naturally. I wouldn't dream of them. I knew you were a good fellow. Suppose we drink on it. Uh, unless, unless you have views yourself, of course. Uh, none. Splendid. What shall it be? Sherry? Whiskey? In here? Well, it's, it's a bit difficult to, uh, to, to hide things up at the house, you understand, so I've washed out some of these bottles and substituted something more interesting than, say, developer or fixer. <laughs> oh, in that case, I think, I think a small developer, if I may. The mental picture of his wife that I formed from Henry's words left me unprepared for the charm of the woman I was to meet. She was as tall and slender as a lily, and as beautiful. I'm no photographer myself, Mr. Mazzini, but I share my husband's pleasure in welcoming a fellow enthusiast. Oh, yes. You'll take some sherry. Well, uh, thank you, I... My husband and I never touch alcohol, but we see no reason on that account to enforce our views on our guests. Um, I, 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 I have some printing frames out in the sun. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just run out and see to them, shall I? Of course, Henry. Which I'll be a jiffy. Here you are, Mr. Mazzini. Thank you. Have you been in the neighbourhood long, Mr. Mazzini? A few hours only. I was cycling through the village and I felt compelled to stop and make a study or two of the inn. It looked so charming. It does look charming. But I'm afraid it's by no means an influence for good in the lives of our people here. I could well understand Henry's visits to the village inn and his stock of refreshments in the darkroom. Mrs. Dascoyne was beautiful, but what a prig she was. I wondered how to ingratiate myself with her and decided to attack on her own ground with her own weapons. I'm afraid we can offer you only a simple luncheon, Mr. Mazzini, but if you would care to stay, we should be pleased to welcome you at our table. You are most kind, but I feel I should not intrude. It's no intrusion. I'm afraid it is. May I explain? Please do. It was only when your husband told me his name that I realised that I'd come by chance into the most embarrassing situation. My mother was a member of the Dascoyne family. She married, as they thought, beneath her... And from that day, they refused to recognize her or my existence. I feel, therefore, that although in the circumstances you might hesitate to say so to my face, you and your husband would prefer not to receive me at your table. Perhaps you would be good enough to explain matters to your husband for me. I shall naturally leave the neighborhood at once. Mr. Mazzini, please sit down. Oh, you well... have exhibited the most delicate feelings. I know nothing of the history to which you refer... But I've often felt that the attitude of my husband's family has failed to move with the times. That they think too much of the rights of nobility and too little of its duties. How true. The very honesty of your behavior would appear to me to prove them wrong. 
Was Lord Tennyson far from the mark when he wrote, Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood? I hope you'll stay to luncheon. My impersonation of a man of striking character was such a resounding success that Mrs. Dascoyne invited me to spend the following Saturday to Monday with them. When I returned to the somewhat contrasting atmosphere of Clapham, I found the Hallwoods' house in a whirl with preparation for Sibella's wedding to Lionel, which was to take place next day. Before going to bed that evening, I wandered into the old nursery to fetch a book I'd left there. Oh. Well, Sibella, you're not looking as radiantly happy as young females in your situation are supposed to look. Uh, I was just thinking of all the fun we've had in this room, you and I. And Lionel. Yes, and Lionel. Oh, Louis, I don't want to marry Lionel. Why not? He's so dull. Hmm. I must admit, he exhibits the most extraordinary capacity for middle age that I've ever encountered in a young man of 24. Oh. However, it's a bit late in the day to think of that, isn't it? I know. That only makes it worse. I always told you you should marry me. I know. That makes it worse, too. I could not help feeling that even Sibella's capacity for lying was going to be taxed to the utmost. Time had brought me revenge on Lionel. And as the Italian proverb says, revenge is a dish which people of taste prefer to eat cold. The following Saturday, I left London in the middle of the night and reached Henry's house just before dawn. It took a mere five minutes to get into the potting shed and substitute petrol for paraffin in the darkroom lamp. Then I repaired to a meadow and took a few hours' sleep while awaiting the hour at which I could reasonably arrive at the house. But the day dragged by in an agony of suspense for me. Henry took photograph after photograph, but seemed to have no urge whatever to follow it up with a visit to the darkroom. I began to fear he'd suddenly taken the pledge. This is the last one. Still. Still. Like this? That looks lovely. Hold it. That's perfect. There. I think that'll do. Uh, look, Edith, if you don't mind, I'll just go and develop these before tea. Uh... Do you care to come, Mr. Mazzini? I would indeed, but I have a slight headache. The sun, I think. And I'm afraid the chemicals wouldn't oh, improve it. Pity. Mr. Mazzini and I will have tea under the tulip tree. Right, her. I've always found that most beneficial for a headache. With milk, Mr. Mazzini? Please. Thank you. Mr. Mazzini? Yes. I hope you'll forgive my speaking to you on a personal matter, but it worries me that Henry should spend so much time on his hobby that he's little left for any more useful activity. Has he never shown any wish for a career in politics? None. Nor any other ambitions? <laughs> One only. To win a prize at the Salon of Photography in Brussels. <laughs> <sighs> Can you smell something burning, Mr. Mazzini? I expect they're burning some leaves at the bottom of the garden. But they can't be at this time of year. Look, the potting shed's on fire. Henry! No, you stay here. I'll go. Henry! Henry! Needless to say, I was too late. The funeral service was held in the village church at Chalfont prior to internment in the family vault. Mrs. Dascoyne, who had discerned in me a man of delicate sensibility and high purpose, asked me to accompany her on the cross-country journey. To everything there is a name, <coughs> and a time to every purpose under the heaven. <coughs> a time to be born, and a time to die. The occasion was interesting, in that it provided me with my first sight of the Dascoynes en masse. Interesting, but somewhat depressing for it emphasized how far I had yet to travel. There was the Duke, Ethelred, whose wife and twin sons had fortunately died of diphtheria. There was my employer, Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne. The service element consisted of Admiral Lord Horatio Dascoyne and General Lord Rufus Dascoyne. Next to him was Lady Agatha Dascoyne. And in the pulpit, talking interminable nonsense, the Reverend Lord Henry Dascoyne. And it is no exaggeration to say that the life cut short was one rich in achievement and promise of service to humanity. 
The Dascoins certainly appeared to have accorded with the tradition of the landed gentry and sent the fool of the family into the church. Here's your carriage. Well, goodbye, Edith, my dear. Goodbye, Uncle Ethelbert. No fretting, now. After all, one thing to be said, we all have to come to it. Great thing, you know, family vault like ours. Constant reminder of one's heritage. Now, take this newfangled cremation nonsense. Who wants to see his nearest and dearest put in an incinerator? I think, sir, Mrs. Dascoyne should leave. The wind is turning cold. As Mrs. Dascoyne thinks best. I'm glad we had Cousin Henry to take the service. Boring old ass, but he keeps the thing in the family. People get him strange ideas, he says. I had a fellow write to me not so long ago. Wanted to bury his mother here. From tooting or somewhere. Start letting the strangers in and the place will be full up. No room for us, eh? <laughs> I privately promised him that I would make it my business to see there was room for him. Uncle Ethelred is not the most tactful of men. I could gladly have struck him. Thank you for intervening when you did. Oh, no. <sighs> the house will be so empty when I get back. And yet he'll be in it everywhere. I find the thought of life there hard to face. Must you stay there? A new environment I would... must. For one reason, if no other. They'd say I was running away. That there was truth in all these rumors. Rumors? In the village. There's been gossip. They say Henry drank. In secret. No. They even say that that was the cause of the accident. Oh, I'm sure that Henry would never have professed one thing and practiced another. I, too, am sure. Otherwise, I think I could not survive. We, we have a long way to go. Try to sleep a little. Sleep does not come easily. Please try. I was conscious that a new obsession was about to join the one that I should wear the coronet of the Duke of Chalfont. It was that Edith Dascoyne should wear that of the Duchess beside me, and I resolved to embark upon her courtship as soon as a decent period of mourning should have elapsed. Sibella? Yes. Sibella was pretty enough in her suburban way, and indeed there was no reason why we shouldn't continue to meet on friendly terms. But her face would have looked rather out of place under a coronet. A day or so later, my plans were materially advanced as the result of an unforeseen but highly agreeable conversation with my employer, Lord Ascoyne Dascoyne. Ah, here's a list of bills due for redemption this week, Lord Ascoyne. I've marked in red those asking for a renewal. Thank you. Oh, Aitchison. Yes, Paul right. and Carter. I suppose so. Knowledge Limited. Oh, no. How oh, indeed. Red Bank and Holland. You have a friend there, have you not? An acquaintance. I know Lionel Holland. Would you say that he's sound? I wouldn't say that he was not, sir. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mazzini. Yes, sir. I've watched your progress here with great care and have been gratified to note that it has fully justified my judgment in inviting you into the firm. In view of that, and in order that you may be able to adopt a style of living befitting a member of the Dascoin family, I have decided to appoint you my private secretary at a salary of five hundred pounds per annum. I left the Hallwoods house and took a bachelor apartment in St. James's. Clapham no longer held Sibella's presence to compensate me for the tedious journey between the suburbs and the city. Anyhow, it would be vastly more convenient for her to visit me in my new surroundings. Louis! Ah, let me have a look at the beautiful Mrs. Holland. No, I think I prefer Miss Hallward. So do I. Louis, it's very wrong of me to visit you here. Why? A married woman calling on a bachelor, a dangerous bachelor, in his apartment. Aye, dangerous. These things only become wrong when people know about them. This is a very discreet apartment. That's why I chose it. So that young women could call on you in safety? And so that one young woman could. How did you know she'd want to? I hoped. How did you enjoy your honeymoon? Not at all. Not at all? Not at all. And how was Italy? Oh, impossible. Every time I wanted to go shopping, Lionel dragged me off to a church or picture gallery. He said he wanted to improve his mind. He has room to do so. 
I should reprove you for saying unkind <laughs> things about him, but I can't. Louis, I think I've married the most boring man in London. In England? In Europe. Oh, the Italian men are so handsome, but I could never get away from Lionel for a moment. Oh, but I was forgetting, you're Italian. Ah. Uh -huh. Louis, I can speak frankly to you, can't I? Well, if not to me, to whom? I shall go mad. Already when he touches me, I want to scream. When you touch me, Louis, I want to purr. Oh, what am I doing? You know very well. You're playing with fire. At least it warms me. I must go. Lionel is dining at home tonight. And where is Lionel dining tomorrow night? With some business acquaintances. And where are you dining tomorrow night? Here. Here. Poor little imprisoned bird. Well, she was welcome to come and flutter her wings with me. I could think of many more disagreeable ways of killing time, pending the arrival of the moment when the conventional decencies would permit me to make my declaration to Edith. As to the other undertaking, I had not forgotten or forgiven the boredom of the sermon at young Henry's funeral, and I decided to promote the Reverend Lord Henry Dascoyne to next place on the list. I therefore assume the garb and character of a colonial bishop, spending his vacation making a collection of brass rubbings from country churches. Good evening, my lord. Oh, oh, good evening. I was, I was just taking a rubbing of this most interesting brass. <clears throat> An ancestress of my dear late wife. Allow me to introduce myself. Henry Dascoyne, rector of this parish. Septimus Wilkinson, Bishop of Matabeleland. Oh. I'm spending my vacation taking a cycling tour around your beautiful country churches. Ah, have you noticed our clear surrey? Clear? Oh, yes, uh, exquisite. The corbels are very fine. Perhaps your lordship would permit me to show you one or two other things in which we take a pride. I should be most interested. Our most notable features, of course, are the Lascoy memorials. Indeed. Every member of the family, uh, to a cadet branch of which I have the honor to belong, mm -hmm. is buried here in the family vault. Oh, I see. Here you see the first duke and his duchess, the dead watching, as it were, over the living. Yes, as it were, yes. The church is exceptionally endowed, also with items of architectural interest. You, you will note that our chantry displays the crocketed and finialed OG, which marks it as very early perpendicular. The bosses to the pendant are typical. And I always say that my west window has all the exuberance of Chaucer without, happily, any of the concomitant crudities of his period. Hmm. Uh, yes, quite. Now, we approach the font. Ah, the font. At last, he did as I had hoped, and invited me to dinner. The Reverend Lord Henry was not, I am glad to say, one of those new-fangled parsons who carry the principles of their vocation uncomfortably into private life. Uh, my lord, the port is with you. Oh, thank you. How do you find the wine? Mm. Admirable. Coburn 69. Mm. No finer year, in my view. My doctor, though, is of a different opinion. And what does he favor? Total abstinence, I regret to say. <laughs> dear me, dear me. Would you care for a cigar? Thank you. Excuse me while I get you one. No, my doctor is continually warning me about the state of my arteries. But I say to him... What possible harm can there be in one glass of an evening? <coughs> uh, or even two? What harm indeed. You do not condemn me, then? Not in the least. There, my lord. I think you will find this cigar as admirable in its way as the Coburn 69. Thank you. If I may say so, without disrespect to my superiors, your visit has brought me something which I could not expect from any churchman in this country. It had 
had indeed. For the arsenic, which I had purloined for young Henry and had not used, was now dissolving in old Henry's fourth glass of Coburn 69. <laughs> I surmised, correctly as it proved, that Lord Henry's doctor would assume that he had succumbed to a surfeit of port and would politely ascribe death to a heart attack. On my return to London, I decided to proceed methodically with the elimination of the remaining minor obstacles. Lady Agatha Dascoyne was a pioneer in the campaign for women's suffrage. with the inconvenient consequence that Lady Agatha's public appearances were invariably made under the watchful eyes of the Metropolitan Police. And when she was not making public appearances, she was in prison and still more inaccessible. In fact, before I could learn of a favourable opportunity, I had to join the movement myself. Secret plans had been made for Lady Agatha to celebrate her latest release from Holloway by ascending in a balloon and dropping a shower of leaflets over Whitehall and the West End. On hearing of this... I had a brainwave. Not for nothing had I been an ardent toxophilite in my late teens. Good morning, sir. I want a bow and arrow. Oh, Lady Agatha, are you sure? Pass the lead look up one bundle at a time. That's right. Steady on the ropes there. No, dear, that's the ballast. Oh, steady, Miss Arbuckle. Pull up the ropes there. Keep the basket level. Perfectly composed, I waited by the window of my apartment. My meteorological calculations proved correct. Borne steadily along on the prevailing wind, Lady Agatha hove in sight. I took careful aim and fired. I shot an arrow in the air. She fell to earth in Barclay Square. Admiral Lord Horatio Dascoigne presented a more difficult problem. He scarcely ever set foot ashore, and I was beginning to feel that this task was beyond even my ingenuity, when he was conveniently involved in a naval disaster, which arose from a combination of natural obstinacy and a certain confusion of mind, unfortunate in one of his rank. Full speed ahead. In this fog, sir. Full speed ahead, Captain. But Admiral Dascoigne... Am I in command of this ship, but are you, sir? I am, sir. Full speed ahead. Destroyer on the port bow, sir! Bring it aboard, Captain. Shall we? I mean, starboard, sir. Port. Both ships sank almost immediately, though fortunately all hands were saved. Save one. Admiral Lord Horatio, obstinate to the last, insisted on going down with his ship. General Lord Rufus Dascoyne, on the other hand, who never tired of demonstrating how he had fought the most calamitous campaign of the South African War, was a fairly easy proposition. It seemed appropriate that he who had lived amidst the cannon's roar should die explosively. I therefore concealed in a pot of caviar a simple but powerful homemade bomb, and through the post I sent caviar to the general. Ah! Oh. Here we are. I wonder who sent that. Good stuff. You to get a lot of it in the Crimea. Now, run into Ruskies do really well. What was I saying? Uh, well, 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 when you were a subaltern, sir. By God, yes. We weren't wet nurse, then I can tell you. Now, stood me in good stead in the last war. You remember it, spy and cop. Enemy concealed behind a small copse. Here. Twenty-four foot dug in here. Suddenly, they charged downhill. They held the guns far until I could see the whites of their eyes. Now, as soon as put a carrier is a battery, then I gave the order. Fire! <laughs> Ooh. 
One could almost believe there was a curse on our unfortunate family, Mazzini. Indeed, Lord Ascoigne, one could. I don't know if you realize how close this series of tragedies has brought you to the succession. Well, I've not actually given the matter any then thought, Then it's sir. time that you did. Do you mean... Do you not realize that you are heir presumptive to the dukedom? That is to say, in the event of the present Duke Ethelred dying without issue, I alone intervene between you and a title. Sir, you... And I am an old man. And I've never really recovered from the first of these calamities. You mean that I might become Duke of Chelsea? I mean that you almost certainly will. And in view of that, I feel it would be more fitting that you should cease to be an employee here what? and become instead my partner. One of my first tasks as partner was to interview Lionel, who came cap, or rather silk hat, in hand. Well, Louis, <coughs> how are you? To save time, I presume you've called to ask for the renewal of your bill. Uh, yes. The fact is, old boy, we sold short and the market hasn't dropped as we expected. I feel entitled to point out that we here in this bank regard our function as the encouragement of constructive investment and not the financing of mere gambling transactions. I know, old boy, but it's like this. At the same time, however, we are generally prepared to give a client a second chance. <sighs> we will renew at three and a half percent. Three and a half percent? Isn't that a bit steep? It would have delighted me to refuse him. However, a bankrupt Lionel could hardly have continued to support Sibella in her extravagances, and I had no wish to do so myself, especially as I judged that the time was now ripe to make a move in the matter of Edith Dascoigne. Mrs. Dascoigne, I am now going to say something presumptuous. You must order me from your house if you wish. It is this. If you should ever feel that the constant support of a devoted admirer would be of assistance to you, I should be most honoured if you would permit me to offer you my hand in marriage. <gasps> Mr. Mazzini, this is a shock. I'm most touched, most grateful. But I could not consider even the possibility of remarrying. Oh, I've spoken too boldly and too soon. Please regard what I have said merely as something to draw upon. Should you ever feel so inclined? Sibella was waiting for me when I got back. I was pleased to see her, for while I never admired Edith as much as when I was with Sibella, I never longed for Sibella as much as when I was with Edith. <coughs> I'm afraid I'm late. Have you been bored? No. I've been looking into the fire and thinking. What about? Oh, how we used to roast chestnuts around the other fire, and what a lot has happened since. Such as? How you told me not to marry Lionel because you might be a duke one day. And how I laughed at you. And how I married Lionel. Now you very nearly are a duke. We are much better off as we are, you and I. It's all very well for you to say that. You are not married to Lionel. Let me get you a glass of wine. Thank you, Louis. The advantage of our association is that we see each other when we want to and we're not obliged to see each other when we don't want to. We don't see each other as often as I'd like to. You've been away the whole weekend. Oh, I had to go. Where? I think you'll find Miss Madeira very much to your taste. You haven't answered my question. Oh, to see Mrs. Dascoigne, the widow of that cousin of mine who was killed. All your cousins seem to get killed. I really wouldn't be in the least surprised if you'd murdered them all yourself. Oh! oh how comes your man? I'm sorry. Louis. Whatever made you say that? Just silliness. Well, if you promise not to tell anyone, I'll let you into my guilty secret. I did murder them all. Hmm. I've suspected it for a long time. What's she like? Who? Mrs. Dascoigne. Oh, she's uh, tall, slender. Beautiful? Yes, I suppose some people would call her beautiful. Would you? I suppose so. I've never really thought about it. What would you say if she asked you about me? <laughs> I'd say you were the perfect combination of imperfections. Mm -hmm. I'd say that your nose was just a little too short, your mouth just a little too wide. But yours was a face that a man could see in his dreams for the whole of his life. Mm. I'd say that you were vain, selfish, cruel, deceitful. I'd say that you were adorable. I'd say you were... Sibella. What a pretty speech. I mean it. Come and say it to me again. Shortly afterwards, my employer had a stroke. There was little that could be done, and the doctor gave him a month at the most to live. 
I was glad, after all his kindness to me, that I should not have to kill the old man. Soon the only obstacle between me and my inheritance would be Duke Ethelred himself. I could lay no plan for disposing of him, as the life he led within the great stone walls of Chalfont Castle was a closed book to me. I was gloomily examining the problem for the hundredth time, as I awaited one day the expected arrival of Sibella at my apartments. Coming! Good afternoon, Mr. Mazzini. Mrs. Daskoin. I was passing through St. James's and thought I'd take the opportunity to call on you. Was that wise? Uh, uh, um, discreet, I mean? There are some conventions which must be governed by individual circumstances. Surely it's safe for a woman to visit a man of your reputation. It is of your reputation that I'm thinking. Ah. Without being inhospitable, I would be happier if your visit were not a long one. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you. I appreciate the scrupulousness of your motives. I have, anyhow, only one important matter to speak of. And that is? I have thought a great deal about what you said to me at our last meeting, and I've tried to think what Henry's wishes would be. I remember he said to me once, You've too much good in you, Edith, for one man. I sometimes wish that others could have a share of it. I have reconsidered the offer you made to me. Thank you again for it, and accept it gladly. Oh, you, you, you rob me of words. Mm, I think, however, we should make no announcement for three months at least. Oh, as you think best. Um, do you not think, though, that perhaps Uncle Ethelred, as head of the family, should be told at once? Uh, perhaps so. Yes. I'll write to him. Goodbye. Louis. Goodbye, Edith. You leave behind you the happiest man in London. This was not a piece of news which I was looking forward to breaking to Sibella. She had no rights in the matter, but women have a disconcerting ability to make scenes out of nothing and to prove themselves injured when they themselves are at fault. A day or so later, I received a letter from Lionel. He requested an interview with me at his house on a matter of some delicacy. I was somewhat perturbed, for nine times out of ten what is referred to as a matter of some delicacy is, in point of fact, one of extreme indelicacy. Two days later, therefore, I made the tedious journey to Bayswater. It was typical of Lionel that he should live on the wrong side of the park. I'd always admired the sporting way in which you took Sibella marrying me and not you. Some fellows would have taken it very differently, but may the best man win, you said, and when I won, you behaved like a gentleman. Are you sure you won't have a drink? No, thank you. Never during the day. Um, so, I thought as you'd been keen on Sibella at one time, and you and I are old friends, I, I'd i ask you to help us. Help you? I, uh, I uh, told you some time back business hasn't been going so well. Uh, since then, it's gone worse. <clears throat> I'm bankrupt. So... I said to myself, why not talk to my old pal Louis Mazzini, who we used to have such jolly times with round the old nursery fire of roasting chestnuts? I'm afraid your memory is deceiving you. By no stretch of imagination could you and I be described as ever having been pals. And if I remember correctly, we detested each other cordially from the first day we met, with a detestation which increased with our years. I always thought of you as a pal who was held on. That's why I said to myself. It's only fair to warn you that any further expense of breath on this subject will be a waste of time. You know what you're doing. Condemning me to death. What do you mean? Only one way out for me. Do away with myself. Oh, if you knew how absurd those histrionics sound. Well, I'm insured. At least the little woman will be provided oh, for. Don't be ridiculous. Louis, I appeal to you. On my knees, I appeal to you. Not for my sake. But for the sake of the little woman, please rise from that absurd position. All I can say is, I think you're a cad, a selfish cad. Let me remind you of a little not-so-ancient history. When I was a draper's assistant and you a rich father's son, you showed me no kindness. Now our positions are reversed, and you come whining to me for favours. Draper's assistant, that's right. Rotten little counter-jumper, that's all you are, very high and mighty now. But your mother married an Italian organ grinder. Get up out of that chair. Hey? I said get up. I will not tolerate hearing my mother's name on your coarse lips. So, you want to fight? Well, whatever else Lionel Holland is, he's not a coward. Oh, there seems to be no point in prolonging this vulgar brawl, and I refuse to demean myself by fighting with a drunken oath. <coughs> if you take my advice, 
You pick yourself up and go and put your head under a cold tap. When I got back to my apartment, I took a bath and decided to relax for half an hour and efface this disagreeable scene from my memory. I was not allowed to relax for long. Sibella! Oh, Louis! Oh, really, Sibella, you do choose the most unusual hours to visit a fellow. Well, you'd better come in. I'm sorry to worry you when you must be so busy, but I have a piece of important news, bad news. I thought you ought to know at once. Lionel has found out about us, about my coming here. Really? Yes. Oh? I had the most dreadful scene with him last night. I suppose even Lionel isn't stupid enough to be deceived forever. You won't take it so calmly when you hear. He's going to start divorce proceedings. That's very unsophisticated of him. There's only one possible way out that I can see. And that is? Lionel is still in love with me. My happiness is all he cares about. He might do the gentlemanly thing and let me divorce him. If? If I were in a position to explain to him that otherwise he would be jeopardizing the social position not only of the future Duke, but also of the future Duchess of Chalfont. I see. You're a clever little thing, Sibella, but not quite clever enough. What do you mean? I mean that not only do I know that you're blackmailing me, oh. an ugly word, but the only appropriate one, but I also know that you're bluffing me. Call my bluff and see. I will. It so happens that I was with Lionel less than an hour ago, and it was transparently clear from his demeanour and conversation that he had not the faintest suspicion that you and I had any relationship other than that of, as he would probably put it, old pals who used to roast chestnuts together round the jolly old nursery fire. So, while thanking you for the honour that you've done me, I must decline your offer because I have other arrangements which make it impossible for me to accept it. Namely? I am shortly going to announce my engagement to Mrs. Dascoigne. Oh! May I say that I think you've behaved despicably. Has it ever occurred to you, Sibella, that we serve each other right, you and I? Would it be asking too much of your manners to escort me to the door? I had suspected that to confide the secret of my engagement to Mrs. Dascoigne to the Duke might be an adroit manoeuvre, and I was proved correct, for it produced an invitation for Edith and me to spend a few days at the castle. I must confess that I could not suppress an agreeable sensation of triumph as I approached the gateway. It was just an informal little house party. Our fellow guests were Lady Redpole and her daughter Maud, who most suitably resembled nothing so much as a red-pole cow and had little more conversational ability. Did you go to the opera this season? No. In the afternoon, Ethelred invited me to inspect the castle. I had never been in a building so lavishly equipped with the instruments of violent death. Feel the weight of that sword. Our ancestors must have been fine men, Louis. They seemed, however, ill-adapted to the discreet requirements of 20th century homicide. And the end of the day found my host still intact and myself still without a plan. Try this. Coban 69. What? Coban 69. Family favourite, so to speak. Old Henry was inordinately fond of it. Uh, so I believe. Uh, so young Henry drank too, you know. Oh, surely not. Mm. I wouldn't say anything to his wife, of course. Mm, beautiful woman, Edith. You're a lucky fellow, Louis. Mm. I never cease to be conscious of that. I suppose I ought to call you Louis now that you're one of the family. Have a nut. Thank you. What do you think of Maud? Oh, charming girl. Though perhaps at times her conversation is a little uh, lacking in Most sparkle. boring woman I've ever met. Only got two interests in life. Her stomach and her horses. Plain, too. But good breeding stock. Yes, <clears throat> good breeding stock the red poles, and they litter a very high proportion of boys. Do I gather you to mean? <laughs> Spoke to old lady Redpole this afternoon. Only too glad to get the girl off her hands. My congratulations. Well, uh, uh, duty to the family, really. Uh, wh when does the union take place? Very soon. <clears throat> I'm not growing any younger. Mightn't get a son first time either. <clears throat> Have a quiet wedding, I thought. Maud's hardly the type for St. Margaret's. We shall honeymoon on the Riviera, and then go on to Italy afterwards. No sense in inflicting her on one's friends. When she's got a family, that, that, that'll keep her out of the way. Wait, what? 
This news threw me into such distress of mind that had I had poison in my possession, I would probably have administered it to Ethelred there and then, and chanced the consequent inquiries. One thing was clear. If I did not succeed in disposing of him during this present visit to the castle, I was likely to see the ruin of my whole campaign. Next morning, I went out shooting with Ethelred, or rather to watch Ethelred shooting, for my principles will not allow me to take a direct part in blood sports. The left and the right, by gad! What do you think of that, Louis? Remarkable. Morning, Your Grace. Been round the traps this morning, Hoskins? Uh, not yet, Your Grace. Don't go that way, sir. Oh, why? I've got a trap set there, sir. Oh, my God, so you have. Shouldn't I to get caught in that? What's it for? Been losing so much game lately. Had to start setting the man traps again. Place is stiff with poachers. Do you ever catch any this way? Oh, caught one yesterday. What do you do with them? Charge them? No. Hoskins smashes them and lets them go. They don't poach on my land again, I can tell you. <laughs> All right, Hoskins. Keep fooling the traps around, or the blighters will tell each other where they are. Yes, Your Grace. Getting on for lunchtime. Shall we go back? By all means. I thought man traps were illegal. Well, they are. Well, what happens if one of the poachers tells the police? He comes up before the bench for poaching and gets six months in jail. If he keeps his mouth shut, he just gets a hiding and a few days in bed with a lacerated leg. Which would you choose? I see what you mean. There's the only way to deal with these ruffians, I saw you. Oh. You lost something? Uh, my cigarette case. I must have dropped it back there when we were talking to Hoskins. You go on. I'll, I'll catch you up. Can you manage that thing by yourself, Hoskins? Yes, yes. thank you, sir. Where are you putting it? Oh, by this elm, sir. Now I've got a notion these ruffians come up the gully here. Are you looking for something, sir? Uh, oh, no. No, it's all right. No, I, um... Uh... I thought I'd lost my cigarette case. Find it? Yes, thanks. I'd have another walk round this afternoon if you feel like it. That would be most pleasant. So after luncheon, we went out to massacre a few more unfortunate birds. Blasted birds! They seemed to get up rather quickly, didn't they? What do you mean? As though they were disturbed. Listen. What? What is it? Over there. I thought I heard something. Someone moving through the bracken. Another... Poaching ruffian! Come on! By the gully! I'm blown if I can see anything! He may be lying, Doggo. Try a bit further to your left. Yeah? By the tree. I'm pretty certain it came from there. Oh! Oh, blast! What's happened? It's like one of these blasted traps. Horses must have moved them round. Louis, get me out of this. Hurry up. Be quiet, Ethelred. I want to talk to you for a minute. What's the matter? You gone mad? No. But if you make so much noise, I shall blow your head off. <laughs> By the time anyone has heard the shot, I shall be running back toward the castle shouting for help. I shall say that you stepped on the trap and that your gun went off accidentally as it fell. So be quiet. To spare you as much pain as possible, I'll be brief. When I've finished, I shall kill you. <laughs> You'll be the sixth Dascoin that I've killed. What do you want to know why? In return for what the Dascoins did to my mother, you yourself refused to grant her dying wish, which was to be buried here at Chalfont. When I saw her poor little coffin slide underground, saw her exiled in death as she had been in life, I swore to have my revenge on your intolerable pride. That revenge I am just about to complete. It is clear that you are insane. Give me the gun at once. From here, I think, the wound should look consistent with the story that I shall tell. No! And so Ethelred, 8th Duke of Chalfont, duly came to his place in the family vault. There were few Dascoins left to mourn him. My employer, Lord Dascoin the banker, who was 9th Duke of Chalfont for the shortest possible period, having expired of shock on hearing that he had succeeded to the title, and so I became the 10th Duke of Chalfont. And one evening, a few weeks later, 
an affecting little feudal ceremony took place to welcome me into residence at the castle. And I promise you that my first consideration, and that of Mrs. Dascoigne, who has done me the honor to consent to be my wife, will be the welfare of the estate and the people who live on it. God bless you all. Some of the older tenants on the Chalfont estates are waiting to be introduced to you, Your Grace. Oh, yes, of course. That is customary, I believe. Uh, yes, Your Grace. You'd better come with me, Hoskins, and tell me who they all are. Certainly, Your Grace. Now, the Sprocket Farm, not Your Grace. Thank you. Good evening. Pennyman, Your Grace, from Sprocket's Farm, and Mrs. Pennyman. How do you do? My son, Tom. Do you work at Sprocket's Farm, Tom? Yes, Your Grace. Aye, uh, he's a good lad. Mr. Wyvold, your grace, chief herdsman at Spotted Farm. Oh, yes, I've heard of you, Mr. Wyvold. Thank you, yes. Mr. Um, Burgoyne. Uh, Sprockets Farm? Uh, no, your grace, from uh, Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? A matter of some delicacy. Uh, you are, I take it, his grace, the Duke of Charfond? I am. I am Detective Inspector Burgoyne of the Criminal Investigation Department, and I hold a warrant for your arrest on a charge of murder. Murder? Of murdering uh, Mr. Lionel Holland at... Murdering whom? Mr. Lionel Holland at number 242 Connaught Square, Bayswater, on the 17th of October last. Utterly bewildered, I tried to fathom what series of events could conceivably have led to this not very amusing irony. I could only suppose that Lionel had actually carried out that drunken threat of suicide. But how then had the blame fallen on me? Time alone and the trial would reveal the answer. Seeing no reason to forego any of the available privileges of my rank, I exercised my right to be tried before the House of Lords. Louis Dashcoin Maxini, Duke of Chalfont, you as a peer of England are indicted for murder. I say to your grace, are you guilty of the felony with which you were charged or not guilty? Not guilty. How will you be tried? By God and my peers. God send your grace a good deliverance. The evidence I shall give before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Mrs. Holland, will you tell their lordships, in your own words, the substance of the conversation you had with your husband the evening before his death? He told me that Louis, the prisoner, was coming to see him the next day on rather a delicate matter. Did he indicate what that matter was? He discovered that the prisoner and I had been... Had been on terms of intimacy? Yes. And what was his attitude? He felt that the correct thing to do was to tell him to his face that he intended to start proceedings for divorce. From your knowledge of the prisoner, how would you expect him to receive that news? I should expect him to be very angry. Now he was heir to a dukedom he had no more use for me. I see. He was trying to discard you. Yes. Mrs. Holland. I apologize for submitting you to this ordeal, but will you tell their lordships how you found your husband's body? I came back about half past four. I went into my husband's study. He was lying on the floor with a dagger stuck in his chest. One last question, Mrs. Holland. Had your husband ever at any time threatened suicide? Never. Thank you, Mrs. Holland. My client craves their lordship's permission to cross-examine the witness himself. Their lordship's grants their permission. Thank you. Mrs. Holland, you understand the meaning of being on oath? Of course. You realize that a life may depend upon the truthfulness of your evidence? Yes. I put it to you that your story of your conversation with your husband on the night before his death is a complete fabrication. It is not. I put it to you that your husband committed suicide. He would never have done that without leaving a message for me. Can you swear that he did not? The police searched the room very thoroughly. They didn't find anything. I suggest that your evidence is a tissue of lies dictated by motives of revenge. It is not. It is not. I presume that the prisoner has some purpose in these submissions other than that of distressing the witness? My purpose, my lord, is to determine the truth. That, your grace, is the whole purpose of this assembly. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. You are Edith Dascoigne Maxine, Duchess of Chalfond. 
I am. When and where did you become the wife of the accused? Yesterday morning, in Pentonville Prison. I wanted to publish irrevocably before the whole world my faith in his innocence. I wanted to show by my marriage that though he was led astray, as I believe, by that innate kindliness and courtesy of his, which made it so hard for him to rebuff the advances of a woman, I nevertheless regard him as a man to whom I can happily entrust the remainder of my life. I am not alone in his opinions of him. My late husband Henry and his late uncle Ethelred, the eighth duke, both unfortunately unable to testify today, these and other members of the Dascoyne family, had they been alive, would I know have echoed every word that I have said. Oh, Your Grace, the deceased was a client of the banking house of which you are chairman and managing director. He was. In the normal course of business transactions, he would have come to see you at your office? Yes. Instead of which, he asked you to go to his house? Yes. He invited you to his house to discuss business? Did you ask their lordships to believe that? Yes. In the course of this uh, business discussion, he burst into tears, fell on his knees, and threatened suicide. Yes. Is that usual in business discussions? Not usual, no. But it happened on this occasion. Yes. And you asked their lordships to believe that? Yes. Then this uh, um, business discussion became so heated that blows were exchanged, and he made a murderous attack on you. Yes. Is that usual in business discussions? No. But it happened on this occasion? Yes. And you asked their lordships to believe that? Yes. Very well. You heard of cases of a jealous husband and his wife's lover coming to blows? Yes. Frequently? It is one of the clichés of the cheaper kind of fiction. <laughs> I put it to you that in this case it happened not in fiction, but in fact. I put it to you that it did not. I put it to you further that being unaware at that time of your future wife's forgiving nature, you assumed that if you were cited in a divorce suit, it would ruin your chances of making this advantageous match with a wealthy and beautiful woman. No, not at all. Still, you were proposing to discard Mrs. Holland? No. Even though you were about to be married to the other lady? Thank you, Your Grace. That is all. I must confess to feeling quite intrigued as to the decision of my peers. Yes. My lords, having justly considered your verdict, the question for your lordships is this. Is the prisoner guilty of the felony whereof he stands indicted, or not guilty? Guilty, upon my honour. Guilty, upon my honour. Guilty, upon my honour. Guilty, upon my honour. Thus was I, Louis Mazzini d'Ascoigne, 10th Duke of Chalfont, unjustly condemned for a murder I did not commit. You uh, have a visitor, Your Grace. My wife? Uh, no, Your Grace. Uh, Mrs. Holland. Louis. Sibella. I considered it both seemly and touching that my dear wife should visit me, as she did this morning to make her farewells. Your arrival, on the other hand, appears to me unseemly and tasteless in the extreme. I couldn't bear my last sight of you to be that look of hatred you gave me as you went out from the trial. In view of the fact that your evidence had put the rope round my neck, you could hardly expect a glance of warm affection. Isn't there any hope? What hope could there be? I was only thinking... That question you asked at the trial about Lionel leaving a suicide note. Suppose he did. Suppose that one were found, even now, this last evening. It would savour of a miracle. Miracles can happen. Miracles could happen. A note might be found. I see. It's strange, isn't it, how things turn out? Now, if you had married me instead of Edith... Or you had married me instead of Lionel... He would still be alive, and you wouldn't be going to be hanged tomorrow morning. Unless, of course, you had murdered somebody else. All of which is rather beside the point, isn't it? Is it? Do you remember in the old days how we used to play ten green bottles? And if one green bottle should accidentally fall... There'd be nine green bottles standing on the wall... Quite a lot of green bottles have accidentally fallen, haven't they, one way or another? And every one of them a Dascoin. Mm. 
We do seem to be a very short-lived family, I must admit. Of course, Edith is only a dusk going by marriage, so I suppose her prospects of a long life are better. Perhaps. Except for a miracle, like the other one we were talking about. Ah, uh, so now we have two miracles in mind, do we? Lionel's note and Edith's early demise. Yes. I wonder. If they are in any way dependent on each other. They might be. What do you think? Time's up, Your Grace. What do you think? Poor Edith. I'm afraid all this is going to take years off her life. Do you think so? I'm almost certain of it. Au revoir, Louis. Au revoir, Sibella. So there it was. She would find a note if I, in return, would murder Edith. What could I do but accept? After all, I could always decide afterwards which of these two green bottles would finally, accidentally, have to fall. Dear Edith, captivating Sibella, how different they were, and how well I knew each of them, or so I thought. But the night has gone by, and nothing has happened. Signed under my hand this 8th day of August, 1902. Louis Dasmoy, Mazzini, Duke of Chalfont. Already, I'm afraid so. If you have any last instructions, I... I think, Colonel, it only remains to thank you for your many kindnesses. Oh, your grace. <clears throat> Won't you introduce our friend? Uh, Mr. Elliot... His Grace, the Duke of Chalfont. Good morning, Your Grace. This won't take a moment, but first, if Your Grace will pardon the liberty, I should like to read some uh, verses composed by myself for use on these melancholy occasions. <laughs> Your Grace permits? With pleasure. As you see by this pile of manuscript here, I too have not been idle. Eh? Oh, <laughs> a fellow artist, Your Grace. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, reflect. Oh, pardon me. Your grace, reflect while yet of mortal breath. Some span, however short, is left to thee. How brief the total span twixt birth and death. How long thy coming tenure of eternity. <laughs> Thank you. Your grace, prepare. Colonel! <laughs> Colonel, what does this mean? This letter has come from Whitehall, sir. Hmm? The messenger said it was to be delivered to you immediately. Uh, excuse me. Uh, thank God. Your Grace, this letter is from the Home Office. Eh? Apparently a note has been found, undoubtedly in Mr. Holland's handwriting, expressing his intention to commit suicide. It is a miracle. Yes, it is like a miracle. Pending receipt of further instructions, I'll try to make you reasonably comfortable in my quarters. I imagine you won't be sorry to leave here. It is a trifle austere. Goodbye, Mr. Elliot. I'm sorry our acquaintance was so short-lived. Good morning, Your Grace. Good morning. I'm gratified to think that the Home Office lost no time in ordering your immediate release. <laughs> Elliot, if he'd not insisted on reading that abominable poem, he would have had me neatly dangling at the end of his rope before the news arrived. Undoubtedly, yes. He was so looking forward to it. I understand your grace from the men on duty outside, but a large crowd awaits your leaving. Having robbed them of the pleasure of my death, the least I can do is let them see me alive. Including, by the way, not only her grace the Duchess, but also uh, Mrs. Holland. Ah, I see. How does the song go? How happy could I be with either were t'other dear charmer away? <laughs> goodbye, Colonel. Uh, goodbye, Your Grace. All right, Porter. Open the gate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excuse me, Your Grace. Yes. I represent the magazine Titbits by whom I am commissioned to approach you for the publication rights of your memoirs. My memoirs? Oh, my memoirs. My memoirs? A brief history of the events leading thereto 
written on the eve of his execution by Louis d'Ascoigne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, who ventures to hope that this confession of his guilt may prove a... His guilt may prove not uninteresting to those who remain to read it. Well... Yes, Your Grace. Your memoirs. My God! My memoirs! Robert Powell played Louis Mazzini and the Duke, the Duchess, the Banker, the Parson, the General, the Colonel, the Admiral, young Ascoigne, young Henry, and Lady Agatha in Kind Hearts and Coronets. Sibella was played by Elizabeth Bell, Edith by Fiona Walker, and The Hangman by Timothy Bateson. Mrs. Mazzini was played by Sonia Fraser, Lionel by John Webb, The Schoolmistress by Diana Bishop, Mr. Perkins by Sean Probert, The Girl in the Boat by Jenny Lee, The Boatman by Hayden Wood, Hoskins by Martin Reed, and a reporter, John McAndrew. The Lord High Steward was played by Patrick Barr, the Crown Counsel, Godfrey Kenton, the Defence Counsel, John Rye, the Clerk of the Parliament, John Church, Detective Inspector Burgoyne by David McAllister, the Prison Governor by Alexander John, and a Warder by John Livesey. The music was composed and played by Terence Albright. Kind Hearts and Coronets was adapted for radio by Gilbert Travers Thomas from the Ealing Studios screenplay by Robert Hamer and John Dighton, which was based on the novel Israel Rank by Roy Horniman. Kind Hearts and Coronets was directed by Ian Cotterell.